airborne before he was uh, shot down in a fiery crash and he died instantly. Uh, Whiteman was the first airman, U.S. airman killed in World War II and he posthumously received the Purple Heart and six other medals. And in 1955, this, the Sedalia Air Force Base was renamed George A. Whiteman Air Force Base. And what I tried to illustrate with Whiteman and these other stories I'm going to share with you is really uh, two words, and that's minor courage. Now, we often think of courage as courage on a battlefield, like the case of Whiteman. And there's also a second wonderful case from World War II, but the other three cases deal with a different kind of courage. Uh, the second case from World War II deals with a fellow named Robert Silhavy. Silhavy graduated uh, from the Missouri School of Mines in spring of 1941. He also was commissioned as a second lieutenant and he was sent to the Philippines in uh, late August of, of 1941. And his, his assignment there was to develop a demolition team. And 10 days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the, the Japanese assault throughout the South Pacific hit the Philippines and his demolition team was assigned the task of, of destroying highway and railroad bridges. And on December 17th, this is just 10 days after Pearl Harbor, so Haiti and his team put a charge on a railroad bridge and they get to safety and under fire, they, they detonate this charge and it doesn't bring down the bridge. So Sohavi gets another charge and he races back to the bridge, sets the charge, races back under fire, and they detonate the bridge, it's destroyed, and they're able to slow the Japanese advance. Well, later in, in early 1942, Silhavi is part of the defense of, of the Batam Peninsula with other American and Philippine forces, and he unfortunately is captured and is part of the horrific Batam Death March which was 62 miles long to a prisoner of war camp in the Philippines. And he was later taken to a prisoner of war camp in, in Japan. And what these two guys illustrate is absolute selflessness, absolute courage, not worrying about what was going to happen to them, but how could they advance the greater good. And the reason I, I use these two examples is to uh, talk about a chapter I include in the book that I call Miners at War. And what I discovered in the research for this book was no matter what the foreign war was that, that the United States was involved in from the Spanish-American War forward, the minor campus was supportive of that war effort. In World War I, for example, when we had fewer than 300 students, uh, about three quarters of them went down and enlisted. And by the end of the war, over 600 alumni and students and six faculty participated. And in World War II, it's over 800 current students and alumni participating. So that's the predictable kind of courage you would, you would, you would think of when you, when you hear that word. But I want to talk about the three other instances of courage, which call upon people to dig deep and persist. And one of them has to do, ironically, with, with the building that I'm sitting in. I'm sitting in, in the wonderful Norwood Hall today. And this story has to do with a, a female student in 1909, her name was Eva Endurance Hurdler. Wonderful middle name, because it says a lot about her character. And Eva was a St. Louisan. She, when she got out of high school, she worked as a, st a stenographer for a while and then as a secretary until she got admitted to Washington University. And her intention was to become a chemical engineer. Well, in her second year, she learned that the faculty at Washington University had no intention of giving any female a degree in engineering. So she decided to transfer to the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy here in Rolla. And I, I recall distinctly reading this wonderful interview with her several years later, and she described what it was like to approach the campus from the south. And the first building that she saw was Norwood Hall and she looked up, she saw all the windows filled with male faces. All the male students were there to see what the co-ed looked like. And I can't imagine the courage that she had to muster to make those final steps to enter this building to go ahead and register for classes. 
Well, chemical engineering was not an option at the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy in 1909, so she decided she would pursue a degree in mining engineering. Well, she did all that she could to, quote, be one of the boys. She learned very quickly that virtually every student was a smoker, so she carried around a, a pouch of Bull Durham tobacco and cigarette paper. So whenever one of these guys would come up, she, she could give them a cigarette. She became the treasurer of the senior class. Right outside this building at the front steps, she became the first female knight of St. Patrick. But she very quickly learned that there were pockets of resistance to her even being on the campus. And, and there were a handful of faculty, she said, were her guardians who tried to help her and be there when she needed some, some assistance. But in, in the spring semester of 1911, as I was going through the faculty meeting minutes and the faculty were determining who was going to get what degree, when they got to Eva Endurance Hurdler, they determined even though she had met all the requirements for a degree in mining engineering, she would get a general science degree. And she forever believed that they did this because she was trying to break into an all-male profession. Now, the Missouri School of Mines was not unique. This was true whether we're talking about Iowa State, or we're talking about Purdue, or we're talking about any other engineering school in the country because engineering schools believed that women had two strikes against them. One was they did not have the intellect to handle higher mathematics and the tough science in the foundation courses to even get into an engineering degree program. And secondly, engineering was too rough and tumble a profession for women. Well, I, I, I took that first argument and I began looking at every year that the registrar broke down the grade point averages based on gender. And I found that every single year that the registrar has done that since the 1920s, females have outperformed males in, in all, all the uh, uh, curricula. Well, I include her in, in a chapter where I include this fourth person. This fourth person is named George Horn. I'm going to go up to 1950 for this example of courage. In 1950, every public university and college in the state of Missouri was segregated. If you were an African-American senior in high school and you wanted to go to college and you applied to the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy, you would get a standard letter from the registrar saying, all Negroes will attend Lincoln University. So they're, they're not admitted. <clears throat> well, in 1949, late 49, there were two students, African-American students at Sumner High School in St. Louis, George Horn and Elmer Bell Jr., who were thinking about college. And I got to interview Mr. Horn in 2019 and it helped fill in this, this wonderful story. He said a physician in the neighborhood saw him one day and said, well, are you thinking about college? And he said, I, I am. And he said, well, what do you want to major in? He said, engineering. He said, well, that's, that's kind of tough. The best school is the Missouri School of Mines, but let me see what I can do. So this neighbor contacted three lawyers with the NAACP in St. Louis and presented the, the circumstances that George Horn and Elmer Bell Jr would like to attend the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. But they had gotten injection letters from the, the registrar here. Well, they took up their case and in the case of a third student whose name was Gus Ridgell. Ridgell was an African-American student who had a degree in economics from Lincoln University, but he wanted to get a master's degree in economics and Lincoln did not offer a master's degree in economics. So he wanted to attend the Columbia campus. Well, ironically, lawyers for the Board of Curators also wanted to integrate the University of Missouri and the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. So they worked with the three NAACP lawyers and they secured a declaratory judgment from the circuit court in Cole County ordering that George Horn and Elmer Bell Jr. could attend the Missouri School of Mines and Gus Ritual could attend graduate school in Columbia. And this is not just a statewide story, this is a nationwide story. So uh, Mr. Horn told me that they made it to Rolla in late summer and they, they came with their suitcases ready to register. And I, I, I can't imagine what they were thinking as they approached Parker Hall to register for classes, but they, they registered for all the classes they needed and 
were told that there was a new dormitory and they had a room for them in the new dormitory. So they went to the dorm, put down their suitcases and they were hungry after a long morning. And they said, well, where's the cafeteria? And they were told, well, the cafeteria won't open until next week when classes begin. So as, as any hungry young fellows would do, they wandered downtown to find a restaurant. Well, Rolla, Missouri was as segregated as any other community in the country in 1950. There were only 42 African-American residents in Rolla. The children attended the one-room Lincoln School, which is on the south side of town. It's still there. It's no longer, it's a, it's a building that's been converted into a church. Uh, African-American residents could not dine in restaurants in Rolla, although there was one table at the bus depot where they could dine. Uh, African-Americans could not stay in motels or hotels in, in Rolla. And most deeds of property owners in 1950 had a covenant that said that the owner of the property would not sell to a non-Caucasian. So this was a deeply segregated community. And Mr. Horn told me that he and Elmer Bell Jr. had grown up in a very different milieu. They were not used to encountering that, that kind of, of, uh, of bigotry. So they went downtown to a restaurant and they immediately got kicked out. We don't serve your kind here. So they wandered back to campus and they learned that the owner of the restaurant had called the dean of the campus. We didn't have chancellors in. We had the, the, the head of the campus was called the dean, Dean Curtis Laws Wilson, for whom we named the library. And the owner said, don't you ever let those students come down here again. So I asked Mr. Horn, what did you do for food that first week? And he said, well, uh, Elmer and I went to a grocery store and bought a can opener and, and we ate canned food for that first week. Well, they, they, they got the canned food, got back to their room, and he said it was really hot that first night, so they opened their window and left the, the door open to the room to get a breeze, and he said all night long, all we heard was cat calls in the inward. So they had come to a community that was rigidly segregationist. They had encountered bigotry they had not encountered in their entire lives. And it took extraordinary courage for these two young men to stay, even more than, than the one day. They said they had no trouble with the faculty at the Missouri School of Mines. When they indicated they'd like to go up for the football team, the athletic director, Gail Bowman invited them to come and they made the junior varsity football team. And George Horn made the, the basketball team, although he, he did not get into any games. But as they thought about this experience, they decided that they needed to transfer. And they transferred to the Columbia campus where they knew there was a larger black community. So I, I put the, the story of Eva Endurance Hurdler and George Horn into a chapter that I, I've labeled uh, becoming a welcoming campus. And it's been the struggle of how do you women fit into this campus? How do African-Americans fit into this campus over 150 years? International students, the LGBTQ community. So that was a, a tough chapter to write because we started a very bad place for all four of these groups. It has gotten progressively better. It's not where everybody wants it to be, but it has gotten somewhat better. So that's uh, two kinds of courage. Let me talk about a third kind, because I want to leave some time here at, at the end for, for some questions. This uh, fifth example involves a student who came to the University of Missouri Rawl in 1981 from Kansas City, and his name is Gary White. And he's another person that I, I got to interview. And I include him here in this theme of courage because White had the courage to try a unique career path. That, that no one had ever thought about before. <clears throat> he arrives in, in Rolla because he knows it is, as he put it to me in the interview, it was the engineering school in the 1980s. And he really liked the faculty in civil engineering. They were very supportive. <clears throat> but he had heard about a Methodist minister who used to be in the, in the ministry in Rolla, and he was on the Rolla campus in the 1970s, a fellow named Fred Lamar who was at DePaul University, not DePaul in Chicago, but DePaul University in Indiana. And he heard that they were going to, he, Lamar was going to take some students on a service project to Guatemala. <clears throat> he heard about it and asked if he could join and, and they invited him to, to tag along. And he said they went to build a dormitory for villagers in, in the surrounding area to come stay when they were seeking medical help. <clears throat> 
And he said one morning he was watching children leaving their homes, and it was almost all girls, and they either had a bucket or they had a large can. And they were walking to a really large rusty barrel to collect water for their families for the day. And he watched this one little girl in particular, and he said <clears throat> she, she collected this, this can of water, she grasped it very tightly, and she walked along this stream that was filled with sewage to get back to her home. And he said he had an epiphany. He said it was at that moment where I realized what my career should be. And it wasn't a predictable path for a civil engineer. He decided engineers have to do something more to help people in developing countries. And that was going to be his career. <clears throat> well, he got his, his bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering at UMR. And then he went to New York City to work for Catholic Relief Services. And there he, he became very involved in philanthropic efforts in Latin America. And because of his uh, growing expertise, he thought he would go on and get a PhD, which he did at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he found some like-minded students and, and they formed this, this organization to help give coherence to the approach of providing fresh water, clean water to people in, in the developing world. And he becomes, according to many magazine articles in the 1990s, kind of the go-to guy. If you want to get some help and you're a philanthropic organization, you've got to go find Gary White. Companies like PepsiCo and MasterCard sought him out. He became a consultant to them. And as he's developing this reputation, in 2008, he meets the actor Matt Damon. And he learns that Damon has a similar interest. They met at the Clinton Global Initiative, and they decided that they would join forces and create something called water.org. And they used Matt Damon's celebrity status to attract attention, and they used Gary White's remarkable expertise to build water.org into this remarkably successful organization. And without going into the details of how they distribute their philanthropy, it's enough to say that by 2019, water.org was adding 4 million more people, 1 million people per quarter to have access to fresh water and sanitary facilities. So what, what White did was to have the courage to pick this, this remarkably unique approach to a career and had genuine success with people. Now, in 2011, one thing that was so striking to me is I was reading about him. Time Magazine every year has an issue where they call, which they call the 100 most influential people in the world. And in 2011 included Gary White and Matt Damon. So the examples here are of courage of dramatically different kinds. But what it suggests to me is something about the types of students that we attract. And it says to me something about what we do with those students. They exhibit a persistence. They exhibit a, a genuine courageous streak. And I think it says a lot about why so many of our 66,000 plus living alumni have had such remarkable careers. And it's, it's what what I tried to include in the very last chapter, which I call Minor Impact, where I talk about the, the remarkable contributions that so many of our alumni have made to the world. And in that last chapter, I, I write about Gary White, but also our remarkable contributions to NASA and, and beyond our, our three uh, extraordinary astronauts. So with, with that in mind, I'm, I'm quite well uh, eager to answer any questions that you might want to pose. Or I can tell you another story. Sylvia, how much time do I have left? Uh, you've got about uh, five minutes or so. Oh, good. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in another story. This is, this is another courageous story. It has to do with an administrator. And the administrator is, is a man named George E. Ladd. 
And Lad arrived in Rolla, Missouri in 1897 as the director of this, this campus that, that had very few students, fewer than 100 students, just a handful of faculty, and we had uh, four buildings. And some of the buildings were, uh, were uh, about ready to fall down. He had to put some tie rods into one of the buildings to keep the walls from falling down. And Lad could have turned around and left. He'd never been to, to Rolla, to the campus before. He had a good job in Atlanta, Georgia, but he decided to stay and he took it as his mission, and I would, I would call it a courageous mission, that he would save the campus. And what he was able to do in his 10 years, working as a lobbyist for the campus, going around the president's office, going around the board of curators, what he was able to do was raise the enrollment of the campus dramatically. He was able to almost triple the size of the faculty he more than doubled the state appropriations for the institution, and he got funding for four buildings, including the one I'm sitting in, Norwood Hall, which opened in, in 1903. And he was able to do it because he was this remarkably tenacious person. Uh, some people said he was an arrogant person. And maybe that's what it took in that particular time period to, to pull this off, but when he came in 1897, the assessment of the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy by the president of Michigan, what becomes Michigan Tech, is that this really isn't anything more than a simple country academy. It really wasn't a college. But a year after he departed, in 1908, the president of the Colorado School of Mines and Metallurgy said, mining instruction in America is far behind the other forms of engineering education. The three privates do it well, Columbia, Harvard, and MIT. And he said also the state mining schools in Michigan, Minnesota, Colorado, and Missouri do it really well. So what, what, this, what I would call a very courageous leader of the campus was able to do in just 10 years was to turn around the fortunes of the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. And we just were ready to, to take off. And I, as I thought about George Ladd, I, I was thinking about the, the recent good news this campus has received. And, and it seems to me that we have had four critical moments in the history of the campus. One was the founding, which is most important. Second was the passage of the Buford Act in 1915, which led us to offer chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Third moment is when we became part of the University of Missouri system. I think the last moment, the last big moment is the one we're in right now with this remarkable opportunity with the extraordinary generosity of uh, Fred and June Cumber and Bippin and Linda Doshi. I think the campus is poised for another big phase. I see some uh, questions in chat. Does anyone have any questions through chat? I think it's more of uh, comments than anything, but um, if nobody has any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sylvia to kind of close out our day. What a wonderful, very interesting, uh, piqued our interest to grab that book and um, just read, read about the history of which we're all kind of a part of too. So thank you very much, Sylvia. Yes, thank you all for joining us. I just um, shared my screen here. So you ought to be seeing what our next um, speaker series is gonna be. It'll be on November 11th, um, Entrepreneurship, a Mindset, Not an Occupation by Dr. Sean Seiber. Um, so we hope that you can join us and look forward to that. Larry, we really appreciate your time and all of the information that you shared with us. If you have not gotten his book yet, um, I think you can head on over to the uh, Missouri s and bookstore and find it there. So thank you all very much for joining us and have a great day. Thanks for having me.